Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of The Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about ancestry DNA, and specifically we are going to talk about how DNA testing can help with your genealogy brick walls. So I'll walk through some basic steps, um, and then we'll talk about some examples from my own family history so that you can get a feel for how it works. And as always, if you have additional questions or comments, please leave them here on the YouTube video so that we can respond to those as necessary. Let's go ahead and dive right in. And we're gonna talk first about um, your tree. So you wanna make sure that when you've taken an Ancestry DNA test, <clears throat> that your tree is attached to your DNA results and that it's attached to the correct person in your tree. I've seen a lot of you who have trees who just have not attached your uh, DNA results to your tree for whatever reason. And I've seen a lot of you who have trees who've attached your DNA results, but you've attached it to someone, um, you know, two or three generations back from you, like you've attached it to a grandfather or a great grandfather. And that's confusing for you and for everyone else. DNA probably more than just about any other area of family history, is super collaborative, which means anything you do is going to affect um, some of the results or some of the research tools that are presented to others as well. And Ancestry currently has more than 1.5 million people who have taken the DNA test and have their results. And hundreds of those people um, are likely going to be related to you. And so you need to make sure that um, you are presenting accurate information to them. So if you have not yet attached your tree, if you go into your DNA homepage and just click on the settings icon, it's gonna be there where you can attach it. If you've attached it and you're not sure you did it correctly, go into that settings icon. It will tell you which tree it's attached to and which person in that tree. Now, just keep in mind, if you have any adoption in your family tree, so if you were adopted or if you know that a grandparent was adopted, for example, you wanna make sure that you have attached your DNA results to a biological family tree, um, that you have the biological parents set as the preferred parents for any given individual. So you can have both the biological parents and the adopted parents in your tree. Just make sure that the biological parents are set as the preferred parents, again, so that any information that our tools automatically generate for you or any information that is presented to your matches is accurate and doesn't confuse the situation. Now, the next step, once you've been tested, if you're going to use your DNA testing to solve genealogy problems, is to make sure that you've tested the right people so that your base is solid. And here's what I mean by that. I'm just gonna use my own family tree as an example. So in my case, both of my parents are still living. So I was able to test both of my parents. Now I could have tested myself, but my parents are one generation closer to all these ancestors and um, they are a complete generation, right? So there's two of them, they're both still living. Now if one of them was deceased, it might have benefited me to test myself. The other reason you might wanna test yourself if both your parents are living is if there's any question at all <clears throat> about your parentage because again, you wanna make sure that you are um, looking at the right people, that you've got a solid base. So in my case, I tested first, um, just because that was what I thought I was supposed to do, um, and then I tested both my parents. Now I have since tested all four of my siblings as well. Again, I didn't need to do that because I've tested both of my parents, but they wanted to be tested for ethnicity purposes and because they were curious about how it all worked, and that's, that was fine. Now, of my four grandparents, only one of them is still living. So I have tested her. I always encourage people to test that oldest living generation wherever possible because A, we never know how long they're gonna be with us and B, they're one generation closer to those ancestors. So you can see here, I can test my grandmother, which means that's gonna get me two generations closer than if I had just tested myself. Um, to the people that I'm trying to connect with, okay? 
So in my case, I tested my grandmother, but my grandfather is deceased. So I have a few options. I decided to test my father's siblings. So I've tested one of his sisters, and now one of his brothers has taken the test and we're waiting for those results. That's only gonna tell me if my father and his siblings are full siblings or half siblings. It will also tell me if they are the children of, of my grandmother because she has tested. What it won't tell me is, are they the children of my grandfather? This man I have identified as my grandfather, are they his children? In order for me to know that, I have to go back another generation. Well, his parents are long dead. However, my grandfather has a younger sister who is still living. So she's next on my list uh, to get tested. So I'll test my grandfather's sister. I've tested my father and his siblings. And if they come up with an aunt nephew or an aunt niece relationship to that sister, then I um, have some confidence that this is really their father. So do you see the do you see what's happening here? What we're trying to do is make sure that every single generation that we can connect is connected so that we know we have this solid base, so that we know that there's not some what we call non-paternal event or non-parental event that happened early in our tree. If, for example, um, my father was not really my father, then any matches that I received that were not from my maternal side would be difficult to figure out because I wouldn't know who my father was. So by testing him, that's proved our relationship. By testing my grandfather's sister, that's helping to prove this relationship. Then I go back another generation. You know, are there first cousins? Are there second cousins that I can test? And so that's what I've done next. So my father has um, one living first cousin on his paternal side of the family, and he has dozens of, of living first cousins on his mother's side of the family, and I've tested a few of them. I still need to work on that cousin on his paternal side of the family. My mother, same situation, neither of her parents are living, so I've tested her only living sibling. We've also now tested a couple of first cousins on her father's side of the family, and a couple of first cousins from her mother's side of the family have purchased DNA tests and we are waiting for their results. So what we're doing is we're building this solid base whereby we know we are connected to all um, four couples of my great grandparents. And that gives me a really solid base genealogically then to work from. So you need to identify who it is in your family that you can invite to test. And this is a great way to get other people involved in family history. I use the ethnicity to sell them on the idea because a lot of our extended family is not super interested in family history, but they are fascinated by the ethnicity portion of the, fam of the DNA test. And so I tell them, you know what? get this test, it's great, it's gonna give you this cool stuff, and then hey, by the way, if you want, I'll just administer it on my account, connect it to the family tree I've got going for us, and then you can, um, I'll share the, share the results with you. And most of them so far have been more than willing to do that. And so they're purchasing their own tests, and I'm the one who's actually administering those tests on my account attached to my tree. That's how we've chosen to do it in my family. So uh, that's a really important step because if you miss this step, what you do is you spend a lot of time waiting around for the right people to test. Or you end up with a list of second or third or fourth cousins and you're not sure who they are uh, because you haven't done that kind of base, um, you haven't created that base, you haven't connected with those people, you haven't verified uh, through testing that your parents are your parents or that your grandparents are really your grandparents. And um, as difficult as it sometimes is, there are surprises. Things that you know very recently in our family history are not what we've always assumed them to be and DNA testing is bringing a lot of those things to light. So here is uh, kind of a basic DNA testing plan. Uh, again, I would always recommend that you test the oldest living generation first whether that's your grandparents if you're lucky enough to have them or great grandparents if you're lucky enough to have them 
uh, siblings of grandparents, if any of them are still living, parents, if any of them are still living, parents, siblings, and then yourself. Now, most of you have probably tested yourself first, and that's okay. You can just go back and work your way through this plan. Then if your grandparents or parents have any first cousins, you're going to want to test them. And then if you have any first cousins, you're going to want to test them as well. So this is just the idea. Again, the idea is to build a solid base for your research so that you know that you're connected genetically to all of your great grandparents. Because for most of us, those genealogy brick walls start sometime in the great grandparent range. So the next step then is to carefully review each of your matches, uh, particularly the close matches. When I say close matches, I'm talking about any first, second, or third cousins, anything third cousins and closer. Now fourth cousins are going to be important genealogically because that starts getting into the third great grandparent range. And that again is where a lot of us have some brick walls. But you want to make sure you've reviewed all those close matches first and that you've worked with them to make sure that you've identified where they fit in the family tree because those close cousin matches are going to be an anchor in your tree to help you figure out the connections with some of those more distant cousins, some of those fourth, fifth, sixth cousins. Okay. Um, Ancestry has also provided you with a couple of tools. One of those tools is DNA circles and one of those tools is shared matches so that you can group your matches together a little bit more cleanly so that you can start to see patterns and connections. Now, if your family is anything like my mother's family, uh, where there's been quite a bit of intermarriage there, then some of those things are gonna overlap. Some of those circles are gonna overlap. Some of those shared matches are gonna overlap where you're gonna have people who are related to you two, two or three different ways. And so keep that in mind if you've got any of that intermarriage in your tree or endogamy as we call it, um, as particularly if it's recent in your tree, you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to that. So here is kind of the process. Uh, I, there's some privacy issues with DNA and so I always have to do these screenshots that are um, grayed out and it looks a little bit silly but hopefully you understand with these screenshots what I'm talking about. So here is a list of matches. When you click on any match, you're going to see the predicted relationship. Now that is not the actual relationship of you to this person. That's just a predicted relationship based on um, the information that is in the DNA. Then there, underneath that, there's going to be a possible range. And if you need to understand more about that, you can click the little, what does this mean button? There's going to be a confidence. And I see a lot of people put a lot of um, weight or a lot of importance to this confidence it's not as important as the information behind this little eye. So if you click this little eye for information, you're going to get a little pop-up that's gonna tell you the amount of shared DNA between you and this person. And in this case, it's 444 centimorgans, okay? So this person is listed as a second cousin as the predicted relationship. The possible range is first to second cousin and the amount of shared DNA is 444 centimorgans. Um, we also have a little what does this mean link there. 444 centimorgans uh, can be any number of relationships. For example, it can be a first cousin once removed. It's within that range. It could also be a half niece or a half nephew or a half aunt or a half uncle, depending on the ages of the people involved and the gender of the people involved. That's what this is, this is what you're looking at. Or it could be a great aunt or uncle or a great niece or nephew. Okay, so there's a number of relationships that fall into this range or this predicted relationship. Ancestry breaks them into cousin buckets. You can kind of see second cousin, third cousin, fourth cousin here. Um, but but make sure that you understand that there's a lot of different kinds of relationships that this could be. When I was investigating this particular match, I was working under the assumption that it was a first cousin once removed uh, based on the ages of the people involved, based on some of the shared matches information. Turns out it's actually a great 
uncle. And so that's a great, great uncle and a great niece. So that's just be aware. There's lots of different kinds of relationships that fall within any given range. Mm -hmm. So be sure to use the little, what does this mean links so that you can get some tables and some charts and start to wrap your head around some of that information. Next, you're going to want to check your shared matches. Shared matches are the matches that you have in common with the person that you're looking at. So whoever's test you're on, you click on a match, it brings you to this page, then you click on shared matches, and it will tell you here are the matches you have in common with that particular individual. And that's important. <clears throat> it's also where why we want to make sure we have that base established. So for example, the shared matches with this individual are a father, right? So now we know it's on the paternal side of the family, a third cousin, and it's a third cousin that we know. There's a little leaf here. Um, there's a little note that I've made here. So I've identified who this third cousin is and how they're related. And so that any information in these shared matches, and if you've got that solid base of people that you've tested, you can start to make some of those connections. So here's another shared match list. It's got a father in common, so it's the paternal side of the family. It has a second cousin in common. This second cousin doesn't have a tree, but I do know who this second cousin is, and I've identified where they fit in the family tree um, and made a note to myself of that. I've got a third cousin match here, actually a couple of third cousin matches, and I've made a note on one of them because I've been able to figure out uh, how they're connected or how they're related. And then I've got another fourth cousin match. So this is a fourth cousin match, and I've already identified that it's on the paternal side of the family. I've identi identified which set of great grandparents it connects through. And I have a, a, an idea of what great great grandparents it connects through because of this third cousin match. So now I'm just looking at two sets of great 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 grandparents, the parents of uh, the common ancestors with this third cousin in order to place this fourth cousin match. So again, step by step through the generations, you're going to have a lot more success. So let me just share with you a little bit about DNA circles and how those help. So here is my father's um, DNA test. And if I scroll down here to his DNA circles, He's got a lot of them. He's 37 of them. Um, and I can see here that some of these DNA circle groups are starting to get really large. So we've got uh, Jesse and Armelia. They're a married couple. And you can see there's 60 some odd members in each of those circles. Thomas and Sarah are a couple. We've got quite a few matches going on there. Um, you know, So we start to see these collections or these groupings of DNA matches. So if I've got somebody on my match list that I haven't been able to figure out yet, uh, maybe I can come in here to this list of people in this DNA circle and start to see who else they're connected to. So everybody is in this circle because they have a tree, because they have this common ancestor in their tree, um, and we've been able to identify what some of those connections are. But then it, it's just an easy way to group them. So I can come in here and I can pull up any one of these individuals and I can say, okay, who are the shared matches I have with this person? Who doesn't have a tree attached? Who has a tree attached but that that tree does not go back as far as Cornelius, but Cornelius really probably is our common ancestor because I share that match with six or seven or 10 or 20 of these other connections. Now, I can start to do that same thing on some of my brick walls then. So I've used that on my father's side of the family. Um, if we look here on Anne Eva Dittmore, her father was Henry Dittmore. Henry was an immigrant from Germany, and we knew that he immigrated when he was about 19 years old. We have his, his immigration information. He came alone, and he came straight from Germany and came out to Utah, where shortly after that he married Rachel. And Henry and Rachel are now buried actually in the town that I live in, which is kind of surprising to me because I did not grow up in that town. I just happened to land there. Um, and so Henry and Rachel, we have, we have a lot of family connections through them. 
lots of stories for them. We have a family reunion uh, for this branch of the family uh, often. And so we know a lot about them, but everything we, we found said that Henry came from Germany by, him, by himself. Well, I started connecting with genetic cousins through uh, this line. We were able to identify quite a few from Henry and Rachel, some from their daughter, Anne Eva, and her husband, Benjamin. And then all of a sudden there were shared matches that didn't match Rachel's English side of the family, but were coming up German. So Rachel is from England and her parents were both from England, but Henry is from Germany. And we were getting these German matches and we couldn't figure out how they were connected. Well, turns out um, because of those matches, we were able to discover uh, that shortly uh, after George and his wife, Christina died, they died within four years of each other their daughter actually immigrated to the United States and ended up in Pennsylvania and married a man and had a few children. Uh, by the time uh, Christina died, Henry left and came to the United States and went straight to Utah. And a few years after that, his sister and her husband and their kids came out to Utah as well. So this whole time we thought Henry was here by himself and it turns out that his sister and her husband and their kids were all here as well. And we've been able to get some great stories about this whole branch of the family uh, because Henry's sister had some information that she passed down in her family lines that none of us got because obviously we thought Henry was here all by himself with no connections back to Germany. So that was a fun little brick wall we were able to break. Now I do have a giant brick wall. You'll notice here this blank arrow. Um, on John O'Brien. John O'Brien is my great-great-grandfather and uh, we've kind of landed on a birth date of 1841 for him based on some military paperwork and his tombstone but we have varying dates for him. Some, some records say he was born in 1835, some in 1837, a couple in 1841, we have one in 1843, I think we have an 1846 somewhere. So his birth date's all over the place. His birthplace is also all over the place. Uh, we have some records that say Ohio, some that say Indiana, some that say Illinois, some that say Ireland. Um, the earliest records we have of him are uh, his Civil War, his, his enlistment in the Civil War, that happened in Iowa. So lots of locations lots of dates, and then a super common name of John O'Brien. And so we have not been able to identify him prior to his Civil War enlistment. And because of that, we also have not been able to identify his parents. So that's a huge brick wall in our family tree, and it has been for years and years. His daughter, who may have been able to provide us with that information, died, unfortunately, when my grandfather was only uh, two and a half years old. And so, you know, she never passed that information along. Somehow it just got lost over time. So here we have this brick wall in our family tree. Well, we have now tested um, several cousins in this family. So we have um, a genetic connection to Walter and Ada. We also now have cousins um, who have tested coming through uh, Eliza and John. Eliza was married three times. And so she has some additional children and descendants that have tested that are not connected to John, which actually is a really good thing because it's going to help us sort them out. So here are my mom's DNA circles, and she's also got quite a few of them. But here we have a circle for Eliza's mother, Margaret. So we've got this connection to this circle for Margaret and the people who have Margaret's, you know, who are connected through that group of people. You'll see these big family groups here and we've started to create this DNA circle for her based on the people that we have had tested. So that's going to help us sort out which matches um, that connect to us through this couple are from the Jones line and which matches that connect to us through this couple hopefully are from the O'Brien line because we have a DNA circle now for Eliza's mother. So, that, so we can use that as a process of elimination. Uh, any any uh, cousins, cousin matches, any DNA matches we have in common with the shared matches that we have to the children of John and Eliza 
if they are not connected to Margaret, then we can assume that they are connected to John's parents, whoever John's parents might be. And so we can start looking really closely at the trees of those matches, look at who was you know, living where in 1840-ish when John was born. Um, you know, were any of those families in Ohio? Were any of those families in Ireland? You know, who is it? Did, do any of those families have the last name of O'Brien? Did any of the daughters in any of those families marry an O'Brien? So that's the process that I'm working through right now to solve this particular brick wall. And I'm hoping soon uh, to have solved that and then I can do a little follow up for you about exactly how I solved that. So just a quick recap, you want to make sure your tree is attached to your DNA results and that it is attached to the correct person in your tree. You want to test the right people to ensure that your base of your tree is solid. And when I say a solid base, I just mean that your parents are who you think they are, their parents are who they think they are, right? That you've got at least two or three generations of uh, family members, cousins tested so that you've got that really solid first few generations so that you can then use that uh, information as a reference to start sorting through your matches to see who connects with which branch of the family and then you can start to use those shared matches and DNA circles to group people and then as you come up with hypotheses or as you identify potential uh, shared ancestors maybe that even go beyond your tree research you can invite others to test as necessary for example, if I was able to identify who I think might be the parents of John O'Brien because of a match or two, I might research that couple thoroughly, identify who all their children were, and then invite some descendants of several of their children to test to make sure that they tie back in with this branch of the family the way that we would expect them to. So that's the way that I am using uh, Ancestry DNA to break through some of my genealogy brick walls, to understand how the matches connect with each other, to get access to more family stories and pictures and information, and hopefully to someday soon discover who the parents of John O'Brien might be. That's all I have prepared for you today. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.